Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Is this everyone's first session of the day? Yes. yes? Great. OK. Uh, so we're going to warm up. It's going to be not that good, so you, you, you'll only be pleasantly surprised further <laughs> on in the day. Um, so just to get an idea of who's in the room, and then we'll introduce ourselves, um, how many of you have built an Alexa skill already? Great. OK, great. Good. Um, so we will be talking a bit about slightly advanced features, um, especially because we're going to be covering DevOps. Uh, but uh, even those who are new, hopefully this will be a nice inception uh, for when you do get started building skills on how to structure it properly. So uh, without further ado, let's get started and introduce ourselves. Uh, let's start with Benoit. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Benoit, and I'm tech evangelist for Amazon Alexa uh, back in Europe. And on a daily basis, my objective is simply to be in contact with the developer community to help them building skills, either on the design phase or on the implementation phase. Yeah. What about you, Armand? Benoit is from Paris, France. I'm from Madrid, Spain. I basically do the same thing, but from Spain. So our accents are going to be a little bit weird, but I hope it works out, OK? Andrea? And I'm from Italy, actually, okay. even though I sound like I'm from here. Um, and the reason why we're doing this talk together is because, first of all, we're all, all three of us are passionate about this topic, uh, but also we are the three European evangelists uh, for, for Alexa, so we thought we would do a talk together exactly. and collaborate. All right, uh, so let's get started. Learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. The important thing is not to stop questioning. Now, why did we put an existential quote at the beginning of a DevOps session? Um, the reason is that DevOps and building and, you know, de really developing anything is a continuous process. It's a cycle. You don't code once, you don't ship once, and you don't test once, right? Um, so what we're going to show you today is hopefully going to help you structure things and see the tools available that, uh, to make Alexa skill development an ongoing process, a cycle, so that you can funnel customer feedback, so that you can funnel... Um, you know, and prevent issues from, uh, from occurring at, at every change, and hopefully, uh, you know, make your skill better and better. So let's take a look at the agenda. We're going to cover a little bit about the why. Then, um, Herman, you will be taking over, right? Yeah. And covering Testing. a couple uh, tools available for you from the Alexa skills kit side, so things that we create. Um, then uh, Benoit will take over, yep. talk a little bit about some third-party tools, as well as AWS um, CodeStar, so a full deployment pipeline. Uh, and then we'll wrap up, summarize, and finish. Okay, so why should you test your Alexa skill? Uh, probably to fix issues, right? Um, but let's talk a little bit about more the uh, underlying reasons. The main reason why you want to test your skills, obviously, is to uh, have a good customer experience. Um, so, for example, uh, one developer in Germany who I uh, worked with a couple times and I attended one of his talks in Europe uh, is called Ralph Eggert, and he's an Alexa champion. For those of you who don't know, an Alexa champion is someone who is like a recognized uh, voice in the voice space. And uh, what he talked about is when you certify your skill, which is when you publish it for it to be live to everyone, that's when everything starts, not beforehand. A lot of people think that you, know, you build, deploy, test, publish, it's available, it's done, and then you're finished. But that's not the case. Uh, because one inconvenient truth is that when you publish your skill, what you're going to get is uh, reviews. And sometimes the reviews can be about things that uh, maybe you hadn't anticipated, and you have to make changes. But if you make those changes, you may end up creating other issues that create other bugs, and other reviews come in. So really, you really want to uh, consider the development of a skill that is an ongoing process, going back to the quote, and starting from when you publish the skill as well. So let's look at a couple of common um, issues that can occur. First one, obviously, is syntax errors in your code. These are relatively easy to catch, especially nowadays with modern IDEs and modern um, you know, uh, deployment pipelines. Even Code 9 in the Lambda console uh, has syntax error correction. Uh, then we also have the case where you update your skill code 
uh, when you're in development and you push it to production, inadvertently breaking the live version of the skill. So an out-of-date interaction model with the backend code. You also have some dialog NLU errors. So for example, if um, some utterances that you didn't expect customers would say are triggering the wrong intent, these are even more subtle to catch. And you won't catch them with code unit tests. And you won't catch them by testing with only a few people. These are the type of edge cases that you uncover when you open the skill up to thousands. And uh, you really need to have end-to-end -end testing to be able to catch them properly. Uh, and we're going to show you how to do that as well. Uh, external API connectivity issues. We don't have to spend too much time on these, but you know your underlying APIs can change, and that can cause issues. And the, the important thing is not that you have to prevent it; it's you have to handle it well. So you have to account for the fact that those APIs can change and give back a you know relatively elegant response without just saying "doo doo error." Uh, then you have confusing prompts and um, and responses. Uh, which you catch by seeing you know, how, the, um, how the interaction goes, how, how, how the dialogue goes between a customer and your actual skill, and then overly verbose responses, uh, which you could also catch, for example, with a unit test by having a character limit. So these are just a, a couple examples. Obviously, it's, it's not a closed list. There's various reasons why things could uh, start breaking. Uh, and let's start going into the why it's important. The, as many of you, how many of you are developers? Just to get an idea. Most? OK, great. So we're always facing a conflict as technical people, right? You have, whether it's the business or whether it's a customer or whether it's yourself, you always have to balance two things, which is to innovate or to keep things stable. Um, doing too much of both or doing too much of one uh, leads to a lot of issues. So what you really want to try and do is keep a balance of being able to push changes being on the developer side and being able to create, reiterate, recreate quickly, but then also be able to have the confidence that things are stable and uh, you don't have regressions that then end up you know, causing hours and hours of debugging. So uh, yeah, how do we go about making this a, um, a reality? Well, a couple best practices. The first one is infrastructure as code. Um, again, I'm just over um, you know, explaining things high level, and then we're going to look at them in practice. Infrastructure as code allows you to take all of that DevOps process, all, all of that maintenance that is usually you know, seen as the boring part and the manual part, to the developer side, and being able to have everything as code and everything be automated so that it's just part of the development process and as automatic as possible, basically without writing a single line of code, almost. Uh, then the other advantage of having a DevOps side to your development process is that you are able to version control, and if you have everything as code, you are able to share and rebuild and, again, yeah, keep track of what, what has changed from one version to the other and keep things elegant. Uh, CI, CD, um, build, test, and release automation. Uh, you, you make a change, you push, and you know that everything's happening, and then the most important thing is to be able to monitor and see things happening. Uh, we'll see with CodeStar, it's not just a matter of making changes and seeing tests passing or failing, it's making a change and see things happening c continuously through time, right? So you just keep an eye on what's happening. Um, yeah, so uh, again, this is more, more or less the same thing. Herman, do you want to add anything to, uh, no. to this side? Okay. No. So let's go ahead and start with testing. So we're going to have three layers again. We're going to have the manual testing, which more or less everyone should do in order to actually test the skill. So the skill needs to work. Now we're going to start with the, you know, the first level, which is uh, testing. Then we're going to go to the DevOps pipeline, so deployment. right? So Herman, take it away and uh, yeah. walk, walk us through some testing and what's available for skill developers. Let's take a look at some of the aspects of uh, testing when you're building skills. Uh, some of these tools you might know. Uh, some might sound uh, not familiar to you, so that's what we're trying to cover right now. Uh, there are like uh, two types of developers, right? Uh, skill builders. Uh, you have this stage when you're just getting started, when you go to the developer console, you build a skill, you test it on a simu simulator that we have there, an embedded simulator. Um, 
that's really nice. Uh, it's a way to get started really quickly, but we have more powerful tools than what you can see right away from the developer console, right? So we have what we call the Ask CLI, the Ask Command Line Interface. Okay, now the ACLI, it's a way for, for us to do most of the DevOps, DevOps functionality that we're going to explain today. And that, uh, that uh, CLI is using behind the curtains uh, an API that we call SMAPI, right? That's why we're mentioning SMAPI right there. Now SMAPI is a way for us to go into the skill management and testing uh, functionality. Okay, so with the CLI, we're going to show a lot of examples with the CLI, but you can also do them from the developer console, okay? But the CLI is more, let's say, DevOps friendly, to put it some way, okay? So I recommend that if you, if you want to go serious into skill building, that you install the Ask CLI. Uh, in order to do that, you can go to alexa.design slash CLI, and you will get an instructions on how to install it, okay? The good thing is that uh, this command line tool interfaces with your developer console uh, credentials. It, it uses your credentials on the developer, developer console, but also your AWS credentials if you have your own AWS account where you're deploying the Lambda using S3, etc. Okay? So it works with both and it's automatic. Once you have that configuration, you just hit, you, you can do it as, as deploy and you're deploying a skill. Okay? Okay. So let's take a look at our first stage. As you can see there, uh, we have different stages when you are testing your skill, okay? And the first tests that we usually uh, do are related to the voice interaction model, which is the front end, okay? So the front end, as you guys already know, a skill is front end and back end. The front end, we call it voice interaction model. The back end is, is almost uh, always a lambda, okay? Uh, an AWS Lambda function. So uh, we start by testing the voice interaction model, and when we uh, test the voice interaction model, we want to make sure that there are no conflicts in the utterances that the user might say. So suppose, uh, as you know, when we are uh, working with the voice interaction model, we need to map a specific utterances of what the user is saying to a specific intents. These intents are the intention of the user that they want to do something very specific. Now, what happens if we use one uh, utterance that is, for example, hello, uh, that, that and we say that maps to a specific intent, but that, then we use the same utterance, hello again, on a different intent, and we are saying that it maps to that intent. We have a conflict there, because uh, this, the system or Alexa doesn't know how to map that utterance, because it's saying hello needs to map to this intent, and hello needs to map to this other intent, so I'm in trouble, right? So we have a way for us to, uh, for you to, guys to detect those conflicts, okay? And we call them utterance conflict detention, detection. This is an example from the common line to actually get those conflicts. And these conflicts, this, uh, this detection process triggers when you build the voice interaction model. If you ever built a skill, you know that you can go modify the front end, the voice interaction model, then there's a button that says build model, right? So when you click on that model, this process is automatically being run they're trying to detect all the conflicts. And what we are doing with this uh, API call there with the ACLI is basically tapping into those results to get back a, a JSON file that will tell me what the conflicts are, okay? So this is the, fir the first, uh, the first uh, step that we need to do when we're testing the voice interaction model. Second one is the NLU profiler. This is a rather new tool that we added recently. Uh, the NLU profile, profiler used to have in the, in the front end, if you go to the console, used to have a button that, button that says NLU profiler. Now you will see a button that says evaluate model, and inside that uh, selection, you will have an NLU profiler. Now the idea here is to test the front end to see how the, the phrases or the utterances that I'm typing map to a specific intent, whether they are resolving to the right intent, and what are the different candidates that I, that I, can, that I can get in order to map that uh, phrase to an intent. For example, suppose that I have a, I say hello, uh, hello to a typical hello world skill. Usually, the intent is called hello world intent handler. That's what it comes to the template. If we uh, use the NLU tool, we just type hello, for example, and we will see that the selected intent as, you know, as, uh, as the mapping is hello world intent. But we also get a selection of what were the other choices that the system wanted to make, but because they were low confidence, it ended up selecting 
one specific intent, okay? So when you say something, uh, you, uh, the system will never match that what you're saying to more than one intent, okay? It, it always needs to map it to one intent. But when it's doing that process, it's basically making a selection, it's like creating a list and saying, okay, I think this could be the best candidates for intents, and this is the one that has the higher confidence, right? And then it maps to that one. Okay, so the NLU tool is a tool that allows us to take a look at how our utterances are mapping into a specific intents. But uh, it's, it's more powerful than just that because if you're using slots, for example, if you're passing slots, it will tell me what are the slots that are being captured in that, in that utterance, okay? And if you're using intent confirmation, for example, uh, it's typical that you need to, uh, sometimes you want to add some confirmations for intents. Uh, the, you require the user to confirm the intent. You will also see whether those confirmation, confirmations are working or not, okay? Now, what is the interesting thing about the NLU profiler is that you are never hitting the back end. You're just t testing the front end, and the front end is basically uh, uh, telling you this is the intent that should be selected, and this is what's happening, but you're not seeing the response from the back end. You're never hitting the back end. It's all testing on the front end side, okay? Obviously, it supports multi-turn. You can enter a dialog, test a dialog, etc. So second one is the NLU evaluation tool. This one came after the utterance profiler, it's also a way for us to test uh, what the user is saying, different utterances. But this is more to do regression tests. And how it works is you create like a battery of tests where you define what the user is saying and what you expect uh, as, a, as an output. For example, this intent to be triggered, right? So you can create uh, this uh, catalog of different uh, test cases and you can run them anytime you want. You, should, you can trigger the run and run them every time you want. Why is this interesting? Because suppose that you're working on your skill, you're modifying it, etc., but you already created a catalog just like this. You can just with one click run again all those battery of tests and make sure that your uh, utterances are mapping into the right intents, okay? Again and again and again. So it's a way to do like similar to unit testing, it's not the same, but it would be similar to unit testing on the back end running a batch of tests, okay? So how you do it, uh, you can see right there in the command line tool is you do ask API evaluate NLU and you pass an annotation ID. When you create this set of tests, you get an annotation ID after it. It's an ID for a specific set of tests. You pass this ID and you run them, okay? Now, uh, this is... Uh, we are, we are seeing how the model is mapping into a specific intent, right? This is what we're doing right now. We're not going to the back end yet. Uh, intent history is still uh, super useful for us to test the, the front end because it allows me to see uh, what the user is saying and how is that mapping to specific intents. This is happening as differently as I mentioned before, uh, when we test the NLU tool, etc. we're basically building the skill, we're creating the skill and we are testing. Intent history happens on the skill that is already out there and it's already being used by, by, by real users, okay? So when the users are saying things, uh, we aggregate this information. For example, if we have like 10 users saying the same utterance on a, on a single day, for example, we aggregate that utterance and we are showing it in the intent history and telling you to what intent that is mapping to, okay? So why this is good? Because suppose that the users are interacting with your skill and everybody is asking for something specific that you did not have in mind, right? You can see it in the intent history. You can go there and you can say, okay, everybody's asking for this. Maybe I should support this in my skill, right? Because everybody's saying this and this is basically mapping to maybe fallback intent, right? Uh, but uh, this is a good way for us to see what the user expects when using the skill, right? So it's very, it's very useful to basically have a real a good mapping of what the user is saying versus what we are giving back to the user, okay? Remember, you have to have like a running live skill to, to see results here. If you have a, you know, a, like a development skill, you will see this intent history as empty, okay? All right, so let's do a quick demo. Let's switch to the command line, okay? So this is Visual Studio Code. So 
I'm going to run this script that I have here, which is uh, CLI. And I'm going to start with that command right there. Uh, remember that I showed you how to detect conflicts. So let me just go up here so you can see the whole thing. Conflict detection. I have a skill that is like a hello world that has one intent that captures the name. So if someone says hello and a name, we capture that name. So it's a hello world. Uh, and we, we are capturing a first name. That's the skill ID that I'm passing there. I'm basically passing a skill ID of one skill that I want to test, okay? That I already created it. So I need to pass the locale because maybe my skill supports multiple languages. Maybe I have a skill that supports English, supports uh, you know, Spanish, etc. but I need to pass the locale so the system knows which uh, voice interaction mode to test. And also, uh, let's take a look at the results of this uh, conflict uh, detection, okay? So I got a JSON back from using this uh, CLI uh, command. So if I double click here, you will see that I have a total of two conflicts detected, okay? I have results. It's telling me that the utterance that is providing a conflict is hello. So this means that when the user says, says hello, we will run into a conflict, okay? So it's saying that it's uh, mapping to uh, hello world intent because I have a sample utterance that is hello. That is normal, you know? I have a sample utterance called hello that maps to hello world intent. That's normal, no problem. But it's also telling me that I, ha that I have a different intent called my name is intent where I'm trying to capture just the first name of the user. For example, the user says uh, Herman, for example, or Andrea, okay? And one of the, one of the values that I'm using is uh, hello, okay? So that's, that's why it's saying hello is conflicting. Maybe we can see that in the, in the test here. You see here, this is saying that it has a conflict. So here, as you can see, can you see that? Maybe, maybe, maybe zoom in a little bit. Okay, maybe I need to zoom in. Well, I think they can see that. I don't want to screw things up. Okay, so as you can see, thank you, Benoit. As you can see, we extended first name with a hello value, okay? And we're running into a conflict because when the user says hello, there's a chance that it ma maps into a hello world intent or that this map into this my name intent trying to capture that hello first name, okay? So that's a conflict right there. Let's go back. And then we have a second conflict where the system is saying, help me, it's giving me a conflict. Why is it giving me a conflict? Because if you take a look at, uh, can, can, can you see me now? Thank you. So if you take a look at uh, hello world intent here, can you see that first utterance there? I extended my own custom intent with a help me utterance. And I immediately caused a conflict. Why? Because I also have amazon.help intent, which is a built-in intent that is prepared to capture help me, help me out, a lot of variations have helped me, so I'm introducing a conflict there, okay? Okay. So let's go back and let's keep going with the examples. You can, by the way, you can also see that here in utterance conflicts. So you can do the same thing in the developer console, okay? So let's click enter here, and now we are using the NLU profiler. Remember I told you that the NLU profiler takes one utterance and uh, tells me to which intent that utterance will be mapped to, okay? But it's not only giving me that, it's also giving me what were the other choices that were discarded by the system, okay? So if we take a look at uh, profiler.json now, you will see that we have a considered intent section and a selected intent section. Selected intent is the one that got selected. The considered intents are all of the ones that were considered for this evaluation, okay? So let's go straight to selected and we will see that the system told me, okay, this is the intent I selected, okay? For hello there, which is hello world intent, okay? 
That's right. But also, we have the considered intent, and we can see that the system also considered mapping the hello there to my name intent, uh, taking there as a first name, right? Which is weird, because there is not really a name. But it was also, it was also under consideration. The thing is that it got less uh, confidence, so it was dis discarded. That less confidence is absolutely related to the fact that there is not a name, right? Okay. So we have uh, another uh, selection, which was also discarded, which is my name intent, where hello there was mapped completely to a name. Okay, remember that we were also capturing just the first name without any, any phrases or anything like that. One possibility was maybe hello there is a name, you know? Not, but you know what I, what I mean. Okay, so let's keep going. There you have uh, a very good look at what's happening behind the curtains when you are uh, saying something to, to your skill, okay? Okay, so enter. Now we are testing the NL, uh, NLU evaluation tool, which is that uh, tool that I mentioned that is uh, related to doing regression tests, where I have a catalog you know, of different tests and I can test them. As you can see, we pass a skill ID, and we also pass an annotation ID, which is the actual test that I created. Now we can go and take a look at the at the NLU evaluation here, and you can see this is running. This is the status running. That's the one that I just triggered, and it says completed, passed, test batch, okay? If I click here, you will see that I have four tests. You see, one, two, three, four, I have four tests. And in those tests, I'm saying, this is what I want you to say to my skill, like the utterance, okay? This is what I expect the intent to be, when you say this, basically the, the mapping that I expect, and this is are the expected values for the slots. So if, if in this uh, utterance I have a slot, I expect the, the slot value to be X, for example, Andrea or, or a name there, right? So as you can see, everything is green because everything mapped correctly. It mapped to the right intent, it mapped to the, to the right slot, and it basically passed the right value for, uh, for the slots. Okay, so you can export this as JSON, as you can see here. That is exactly what we are getting when we are running the command line uh, tool, running this annotation, this set. That JSON that you can download from here, that's exactly what we get from the CLI. Okay, so let's take a look at that JSON. Start NLU. So what you got is basically well, maybe it's not exactly, because you're getting an ID, right? So what you got is an ID of the running process, okay? So you got an ID saying, okay, I'm running it, so I can only give you an ID because I'm running it. This is asynchronous, right? So it gave me an ID. When I pass this ID to the next step, I will get the result, okay? Which is what you get when you download that JSON. So uh, this process is an, uh, like, like a process in the middle that I need to actually get the, the real information of the test set, okay? So I got an ID of the running process. I copy it, and now I'm passing this via the command line. And as you can see in this line here, this time I'm not passing an annotation ID, which is the test, right, that I created. I'm passing an evaluation ID which is that the, the ID of that process that I triggered, you know, to actually test things, okay? So once I, I pass the evaluation ID, I got an NLU status, and that's the JSON that I can download from the developer console. And uh, let's take a look at it, uh, NLU status. Okay? So as you can see here, we have an annotation ID, which is the test, and we have a, re a status that it was a pass, okay? It was passed, okay? So this is basically saying that the test uh, did not fail, okay? Now let's take a look at uh, the last step here. Enter. Where we're getting the actual results of the NLU. Uh, and let's go here. So 
So from the evaluation ID, we just got a, the, a string that says the test passed. But I'm interested to know what really happened okay, in the test. And that's what I did in this final step that you can see here, where we're saying get NLU evaluation. Okay, that's the command, get the NLU evaluation. I'm getting the full evaluation. And the full evaluation is telling me that I have four tests, total count four, and that I have an actual uh, result and an expected result, okay, for all four. So I'm collapsing this so you understand the structure better. Actual, expected, inputs, actual, expected, inputs, okay. So past one, past two, past three, past four. All four tests passed. The actual uh, result was uh, first name uh, map to Andrea. The value was my, my name is Intent and first name was mapped to Andrea. Uh, that's the actual result of the execution. And this is what was expected. My name Intent, where the value first name is Andrea. So that's why it's a pass, okay? So the system will just determine whether what you expected matches what you got in a single test, right? If, if it's a match, it's a pass, okay? So this is uh, what we have for, let's switch back to, to this machine. Okay. So this is what we have to take a look at how we work with the front end, okay? But you obviously want to test uh, the back end too, right? Because you need to see if your uh, back end is providing the right responses. So for that, you can invoke a skill with the first command. You, you, say, you, you can see as API invoke skill. And there you're, you're passing the JSON request to the Lambda. So it's very similar to when you go to the Lambda and you test requests directly. This is very similar. You pass the, an incoming request and you get a response back from the Lambda. Okay, so this is a way to te test the, the Lambda directly. Okay, via command line. But you can also go full blown, you know, you can simulate the skill. And this is similar, similar to using the, te the test tab in the, in the developer console. You can simulate your skill running, okay? And when you do that, as simulate, you pass a text, you pass hello there, you pass the low call, you will basically get the strings that uh, the backend will return uh, to Alexa, okay? And this is bypassing the ASR system. The ASR is the automated speech recognition. It's a system that translates sound of what you're saying into text, okay? And when you're using simulate, you're bypassing that because you're just passing the text directly of what the user said, which is hello there. But the whole skill gets activated and gets in, uh, into, gets, uh, it starts working uh, both on the front end and the back end, both things, okay? And you get the result back from the, from the skill uh, and you get text, so you are bypassing TTS, which is the process text-to-speech that transforms the text from the backend into audio. So you're bypassing that. You're basically dealing with text. So this feels like a chatbot a little bit, you know? Passing text, getting text, text back, okay? Now, the, the final thing there is Ask Dialog, where you can actually simulate uh, a full dialog with an interaction uh, that... Uh, uh, where you engage into a dialogue with Alexa. Some of your intents might be dialogue-based, where you expect to collect slots, right? So you ask for slot values. If the slots are, are marked as required and they are not there, you're interested in to, to collect the, that information, and you are in a dialogue, in a loop with Alexa. You can also simulate that with Ask Dialogue, and you can go into that dialogue, and you will get prompts to fill in information as you know the conversation goes on, okay? So without further ado, yeah, my turn. So actually what Herman showed you means that you are using the Ask CLI. What it means, actually? It means that whatever happened, either on the front end interaction model or back end, your Lambda code, you will always deploy your skill artifacts. But maybe at some point you are interested into doing some local testing on your machine, you're developing, and you say, well, actually, before even deploying to my skill, I want to test the code on my machine to see what's happening. So that is what we call unit testing. And you're all familiar with that uh, functionality, but also remember that typically uh, what you would be doing, you'll be using like unit testing frameworks. Maybe for JavaScript, maybe for Node, uh, you will be using like Chai or Mocha, or maybe even for Java, you may be simply using GUnit. But when you are using this type of framework, what's happening? 
You are writing code to test your own code. That's the objective, correct? But think about voice and what is unique and different from voice. You are not looking about to see actually what is the JSON input that is sent to your Lambda function and what actually is the JSON output generated by a Lambda function. You are actually interested to understand what is the consumer situation. Is it, for example, the consumer opening the skill? Is it, for example, the consumer asking for um, uh, features, like, for example, an intent being, hello, my name is uh, Andrea, my name is Benoit, my name is Herman. So it means that you are more interesting to understand the situation of the user and what should be the answer your skill will be providing, typically the prompt. So instead of writing code, uh, you can maybe think about third-party uh, testing framework that are dedicated to voice application, typically to Alexa skills, like Bespoken. If you think about uh, Bespoken, what they provide? They provide you a framework that actually you only write a YAML file that corresponds to your test suite. And within this test suite, you will provide all the different test cases. And in watch on them, you will say, well, actually, the user is opening the skill. Typically, you want to target the launch request. Or maybe the user wants to get access to one of your intents, and you are targeting get, in fact, intent. And your objective is to actually see what will be the response of the skill depending on this situation. So typically, the output speech, what we call the prompt, when we do get new fact intent, should be here's your fact, part of it at least. So for you, it, what it means, it means that you will only be providing a YAML description and under the curtain, that will be bespoken, that will generate for you the JSON input, invoke your Lambda code, but locally on your machine without being deployed, and test the difference between the expected output versus the actual output that has been generated by what? By your code. So maybe we can try to see, that, to see it uh, in action. So let's go back to the demo computer. And we can see it. So we will be using the same skill uh, as Herman. So uh, I will just do a little bit of clean here. So I close all the files here. And I go back to the root folder. And uh, I clear it. OK. And we used to be on the test CLI thing. And for now, we want to enter into unit testing. And we want to enter into unit testing using Bespoken. So first of all, what you would do is that you would have like a testing property, for example, typically to say, well, actually, my front end, meaning my interaction model, is located at this uh, specific folder model. And I want to test uh, interaction model being in one local, being in English of the United States. And typically, for my backend code, meaning to know where my main function is, typically for Lambda, it is my handler, I define where my handler is located. Also, I do, uh, can provide other property, whether it's a trace or not. Trace or not. So, after I have specified all that, what I do, I typically write my YAML file, and here I've got four tested. Typically, first of all, I want to test that when I open the skill, I ask for the name, and because I ask a question, and leave the session of the skill open. Then after, if I uh, directly get to the hello world intent, I want to ensure that the response will be hello world. Then uh, if I hit the my name is intent, with a given parameter being first name with the value Andrea, I want to ensure that actually the response, the prompt itself contain hello Andrea, whatever. And as we consider that our job is over, we can close the skill session. And finally, the last test case that I want to, to do is typically, uh, if the user is lost and asks me for help, when he enters into the Amazon.help intent, I provide him with some um, help information, and I ensure that because I ask him a question, that I leave the session open. Um, when I want the user to close the skill and have a goodbye message, I want to ensure that I do provide this goodbye, goodbye message, and I close the skill session. So for me to run that after I've described this uh, YAML file, the only thing I do from the root folder is that by using the uh, bespark um, and command line that I've installed previously, I only do BST test. And typically here you would see that normally we should have an error. And we'll try to understand why we have this error. So typically we have one test suite, the one you can see on screen, and uh, we have four tests and one of them is failing. But before going into all the different tests that are failing, meaning the first one, uh, 
Uh, also, the thing which is quite nice is when you are doing unit testing, you also want to understand what is your cut coverage. Because maybe you can have all the tests passing, but if you are only uh, covering 25% of your code, maybe you are missing something and you need to add more unit testing. So here, typically, what it means. Mm, apparently here, uh, the test that is failing, if we are looking at the failing test, it's seconds three, meaning the third test. When we are providing the intent, my name is intent, with first name being Andrea, there is an issue with the prompt. So what we do? Well, actually, we go to our Lambda code, still on our machine, it has not been deployed yet. And actually, we go to the, uh, let's give a bit more space there. Great. So we have our intent that actually all the requests will be handled with this uh, handler that comes uh, with the structure of the SDK. And of course, because we are collecting the first name being Andrea, but we are providing an answer being hello world. So obviously, it will not work. So typically, what we do is that we will use uh, the slot value that has been collected. In that case, that would be Andrea. We just save our file and we rerun the test. And we will be happy because the test will pass. And we can see that our test suite passed with four of the different tests. So that was to illustrate a bit with a demo the unit testing. And still, if you think about, if we go back to the presentation mode, great. If we go back to the presentation mode, we've seen unit testing. But still, at some point, you want to say, when I'm happy with my unit testing, I will deploy my code. And once I've deployed my code, maybe I want to have an end-to-end -end testing. What it means, if you think about it, skill, it means that you want to test all the different ports that a user would do. What it means, it means that you want to test ASR, Alexa speech recognition, meaning when a user speaks, Alexa will take this audio and transform it to text. Then after, you want to test NLU, natural language understanding, and from this text, ensure that you get an intention. And of course, out of these intentions, you want to ensure that your skill backend is functional. It's working as expected. So typically, by using this plugin, but in an end-to-end -end testing mode, what it means? It means that you will still be written the same type of YAML file. The difference, though, what it is, it is like typically, if you look at line eight or nine, instead of writing the name of the intent you want to target, you will typically write the utterance that a user would say, like, for example, open fact skill. What it means, it means that actually, the testing framework, Big Sparken, will take this text file, transform it to audio, send it to Alexa using an Alexa voice service integration. Actually, you can see it like a virtual device, and it will go all the different steps of the process, ASR, NLU, skill backend, and send back the rest point to Big Sparken. And Big Sparken will actually, actually, actually afterwards, will still do the same thing of assertion between the expected output versus the actual output. And you would be able to know whether an end-to-end -end testing is working or not. So that was for the testing part. And you will say, well, that's great. I'm testing it with CLI or without CLI with third-party tools. But at some point, uh, if you think about the CLI, it's still like you on your machine doing some manual deployment. Maybe at some point you want to change this paradigm, make, maybe because you are working into teams. We're still the three of us working in the same uh, team. And if you'd like to work on, on the scale itself, how we would do that? Well, what it means, it means typically, if you think about AWS and all the different managed services that are offered to you so that you can handle a continuous integration pipeline, first of all, you need to have a source code uh, repository. Well, in that case, nowadays, you can think about Git. And typically, if you think about Git into AWS services, that means that you will host your code into an AWS code commit repository. That is step one. So it means that you, you will simply need to do a git clone, git commit, git push. And everybody could access to this code. Then afterwards, this code means at some point, before even deploying your backend to a Lambda function, what it means? It means that you will need to build it. Typically, for Node, it means creating a zip with all the dependencies. For Java, creating a jar with all dependencies. But also, during the build phase, that could be the opportunity for you to do what? To do this famous unit testing that we've seen previously, for example, using bSparken. And what you can see on screen, the YAML description corresponds to the build spec file that would be used by code build to determine what should be the different operation, meaning all the different commands that will be executed during the build itself. 
So typically, if we go back to um, demo computer to see a bit of uh, CI. Okay, great. So for this one here, let's say that um, even before there, let's go back to my skill and we do have another another skill which is actually the code store demo. And here my objective is that I want to change the answer that uh, actually I send back to my user. So when the portal arrive, okay. So I go to test mode and here typically you could see the answer which is open demo deployment. Welcome to the deployment demo for session ALX 318. Just tell me hi and I'll respond back. Hello world. So here typically when I say hello, hi, hello Vegas, the, the current answer, the current prompt is hello world. But typically I want to change it so that it will tell me hello world live from AWS reInvent 2019. And I want to do that using my CI that I've already set up. So typically to do that, but well in that case, let's uh, go back there and use this one. So where I am. So here typically I have already git clone uh, my repository and I go not to the one we've been using previously with our man, but to a new one. So I will open it back. So that is my code. And from this code here, I say, well, actually, I want to change the answer when a user enter what? Enter into this hello world intent handler, meaning when he tells me something like hello Vegas. And instead of only telling me hello world, it's hello world live from AWS. He invent 2019. And when I've made the modification, of course, here you can see what are the modification? I modify my backend file, my index file from my Lambda function, and I will say git commit uh, updates hello world prompt. I commit it and then I push it. And here's an interesting thing here while it's pushing. As you could see here, it has been pushed to what? it has been pushed to my cut commit repository. So typically, what it means, it means that here, if we go back into our AWS console, uh, and we will see later on in, into the presentation that actually we set up all that using AWS cut store. It will allow you to set out of the box the whole pipeline needed, plus the fact to have this famous repository on cut commit. And there is a template available for Alexa skill. So typically, as you could see, like 31 minutes, uh, 31 seconds ago, I've just pushed it, as you can see it here, update hello world prompt, and I already have a continuous deployment, but we are only speaking for the moment for the first part being the CI, continuous integration. So I have my source, and currently the build is happening. So let's go back and switch to presentation mode to say, well, actually, we can commit, have a common repository for all my team. I can build it, test it. So now comes a phase where I actually want to deploy it. And if you think about an Alexa skill and about deployment, remember an Alexa skill is about having two different parts, the front end and the back end. So typically, let's first talk about the back end. The back end, typically, as Herman's mentioned, it's an AWS Lambda function. So what it means, it means that typically, by using AWS Cloud Formation, you can ISO describe a resource being a Lambda function with all the associated resources, like an IIM role, so on and so forth, or you can use serverless application model by using uh, the resource term being AWS serverless function. And that will create the Lambda function for you and deploy your code. So you will be using AWS CloudFormation from provisioning for the continuous delivery. That is fine. Then afterwards come the skill deployment because you still have the interaction model, and the skill metadata. And those two artifacts, they are not deployed into AWS, they are deployed into your Amazon developer account, which is not linked to AWS. So how would you do that? Well, in that case, to do that, if you think about having the full pipeline that we've shown previously uh, with AWS Code Store, it's actually using Code Pipeline. And by using Code Pipeline, what it means? It means that after going from 
the source stage where you commit your code, then after the build phase, which is triggered on every commit on, on scheduled time, you will go to the build phase when everything happens fine, meaning all the tests are successful and there is no rollback. And CloudFormation, we've seen that, but on code pipeline, when you create an Alexa skill integration, what it means? It means that you have a deploy skill packager. You are providing your Amazon developer account credentials, and this code pipeline will actually deploy on your Amazon developer account on your behalf these different artifacts. That is one way to do it with code pipeline. But maybe some of you will say, yeah, it's good, but I don't want to have two ways of deploying one way cloud formation using for my backend and using a part of a code pipeline with um, the skill, um, the deploy skill uh, packager. So in that case, maybe you are still on AWS and you still want to deploy all the skill artifact in one single file, meaning using AWS cloud formation to provision all your resources. Well, in that case, you can do that. You can do that because typically what you can see on screen is that, of course, with CloudFormation, you can deploy Lambda function and other different AWS resources, but also what is already available in CloudFormation that are Alexa resources. Typically, to deploy a skill, Alexa ask a skill will be your resource type. What you would do typically, as with code pipeline, you will provide your Amazon developer account credentials that you will be generating using login with Amazon, those credentials, you will provide it within your CloudFormation template. And typically, here you will say, well, actually, my skill metadata, skill name, skill description, but also my interaction model, I put all that into a zip file that is available on an S3 bucket. And CloudFormation will take this object from S3 bucket that you have defined and deploy on your behalf on your Amazon developer account. And all that within one single cloud formation stack. So that is good, we're happy, we can CI, we can CD, we have the whole tool chain, but as Andrea mentioned, it's not over. It's not over in the sense that we want to have a continuous testing. Once the deployment and the live happening, uh, you want to ensure that what happened next is that your skill is functional as expected and you can do some proactive testing. What it means, well, typically, if there is an issue with your uh, skill invocation, you can uh, set a CloudWatch alarm, then after you have a um, simple notification service, a topic that will send you some email or SMS to be notified, or maybe simply because uh, you do have like CloudWatch logs with, where all the logs from your Lambda function are dumped. And in that case, maybe if you have a slot, and um, like the first name, and you will get some value like Andrea, Herman, or Benoit, you want to understand which actually is the most used slot value. So in that case, what you would do is that you will build an analytics pipeline using S3 and Athena, for example, to be able to display on dashboard with an SQL, with a SQL request, what is the top slot value used, for example. And that step is quite important to ensure that proactively you will monitor your own skill. Also remember that on the skill side, there is also available the skill reporting API that will allow you to do some HTTP REST requests to ensure that you will get uh, analytics value and that you can create your own dashboard. So maybe Andrea, if we would have to, to wrap up, uh, what would it be? Thank you, Benoit. Uh, so, um, just to recap what everyone has been talking about, first of all, Raise your hands, more or less, has everything been clear? Have you tried to, okay. So we tried to structure it in a bit of a sequential process so that you would have uh, first on the Alexa side, then on the back end side, and then on, as a total end-to-end -end, uh, continuous deployment uh, side, um, you know, recap. But over here you see more or less an overview of what does what. So for example, if we were to start from the bottom, right, if we just want to test our request handler, so what our endpoint, what our backend, what our code re uh, is returning, then we, we don't need all, all of those ask APIs. We could even use the AWS SDK and just send a JSON to the Lambda and see what, the, what gets returned. But if we want to hit every single um, part of the Alexa, uh, let's say, service process, because that's what gets uh, complicated with Alexa when you're trying to do a CI/CD is that it's not just a series of clicks 
and outputs. It's a series of people speaking, that voice getting turned into text, that text getting turned into understanding intents, and those intents getting then transformed into a JSON request that hits a back end that then has to respond. So it has a, a couple more layers. Um, so you see here the graph, you have the, um, you know, if you use a fully fledged Alexa voice service API such as Bespoken, it gives you the full stack. So you start from the ASR, so you can speak to it directly, and then it gets to the NLU, gets to the skill lambda, and then to the request handlers. Uh, if you don't want to test the ASR, then you can just use the native Ask CLI functionality. Uh, for example, as Herman was showing, the NLU API, uh, the, the simulate, the uh, invocation, um, and then, yeah, you can get more bare bones uh, going down the rabbit hole following this graph. The other uh, thing that is worth seeing at a high level is the whole deployment pipeline. Benoit was just covering it, so I won't spend too much time. Uh, but just as a recap, we have Code Comet uh, being our source of you know, code handling, our uh, Git host. Then we have uh, the code build, which actually does the building. Uh, then we can integrate any third party tooling or any testing that we want to add. Uh, for example, Bespoken. Then we uh, build the whole stack using CloudFormation, and that makes up the code pipeline. And once the actual stack starts uh, going, then we want to monitor it and log it with CloudWatch. And that whole stack is CodeStar. So uh, to change Werner Vogel's quote about dance like nobody's watching, encrypt like everyone is, uh, dance like nobody's watching, test and automate like everyone is, uh, because you, know, you may think that your skill is working perfectly, uh, but when you release your skill to thousands and thousands of users, uh, every one of those users will be watching your skill very closely, and as soon as something doesn't work, you're gonna hear about it in customer reviews, uh, in negative feedback, and yeah, it's better to prevent them, especially when you wanna uh, be creating incremental changes and improving the skill bit by bit. So some next steps for you if you wanna get started with the DevOps side. Uh, first of all, we highly recommend VS Code. I know it's becoming the most popular IDE or code editor uh, recently, uh, but it is really, really good. So definitely get that. Uh, also because we have uh, a, um, an, an extension for VS Code that uh, gives you access to top level features of the skill management API. So by accessing the palette, you have shortcuts to all of the Ask CLI functionalities. Yeah, you need to go to plugins and search for ask. Yeah, the ask, ask right. toolkit. Uh, then, of course, install the ask CLI, um, and you can find a link for that. Uh, definitely try out Bespoken. It really simplifies um, a lot of the testing environment with Alexa skills because it's built voice first, right? It's built for testing voice applications, especially Alexa. Uh, and then uh, check, check out uh, the AWS side with CodeStar, um, and the uh, Cloud Development SDK. So we also have some related sessions that you can take a picture of. Uh, we also have, any of you is an Alexa certified skill builder? Great. Nice. Wow, we should have had something to give out. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, so we actually have a specialty exam um, and the reason we, we have these blue sweaters is because we were part of a workshop that uh, created the questions for them. So if, you've, if you find any hard questions, sorry about it, uh, but we had to you know, have various levels. Uh, but the, the goal of the exam is to test that there is a, um, you know, the minimum qualified candidate is someone who has built a skill and is able to build other skills, and that's what we're, t what, that's what we're testing for. So if you have built a skill before in the last six months, uh, do try and take the specialty exam um, as it'll make you a qualified Alexa skill builder. And who yeah. would not want to? Andrea, maybe we can see the result of the, yeah. the Git push, no? yeah. what so, you think? Uh, maybe before uh, thanking everybody's joining us? Absolutely. Let's go back to the demo computer. We can see that actually our code pipeline just uh, finished like um, a few seconds uh, before. So here typically we will uh, redo our famous uh, open demo deployment. Welcome to the deployment demo for session ALX 318. Just tell me hi and I'll respond back. Hello world. Live from AWS reInvent 2019. And the only thing that I did from my machine is simply to do a git commit and a git push. And the rest while handled by AWS services. Yeah. 
that. Um, so, that being said, if you can switch back to the other slide, Benoit, thank you. Uh, we only had an hour today, and th that hour is up, so uh, feel free to go. But if you do have questions, or if you want to follow up, uh, or you want to talk outside, we're, we're here. Uh, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter and um, ask us questions there. Our DMs are open as well. Uh, we just yeah. hope that you get uh, the DevOps thing going with Alexa skills, essentially. Happy skill building. Happy skill yes. building. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>